Hello and welcome to live programming here at the More Freedom Foundation. I'm um, just making sure we're actually running here. If you could let me know in the uh, comments whether I'm coming through okay, um, that would be good to know. Um, today we're going to be talking about China and the Solomon Islands and how that relates to U.S. policy and Australian policy. Normally on this channel, I'm the one here telling you that Washington, D.C. is freaking out unnecessarily, that those folks are crazy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this time it's a little different. Um, I think this is um, something that Washington, D.C. really, 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 really screwed up. Um, and I think that it does have long-term implications. Don't believe it has short-term implications, really. I mean, this is not something that's going to be biting us in the ass um, uh, in the coming decade, but I think for the coming century. And as I've often said, I don't believe China is a threat today, but I do believe that the story of the 21st century is going to be conflict between China and the United States. And this is really the first thing I can point to um, where uh, China has sort of made a move that um, is legitimately threatening um, to the United States and its allies um, and um, is sort of a joining of the Cold War. Uh, as I'll get into further, to be clear, like there's a lot about the attitudes of the United States here, these, this idea that nobody's allowed to have any kind of security arrangements other than the United States and its allies. Um, there's a lot about that that's that's uh, unpleasant or, or incorrect, but it is it is sort of how Washington D.C. sees the world, and this is probably the most real threat to that uh, that China has made. Um, so anyway, we'll get into that in detail. Uh, before we get started, I just want to point out, in case you're new here, um, we've got the live chat going uh, to I think the right of your screen. Depends on how you are watching this. Uh, you are invited to uh, say anything in that live chat about me, um, about the way that I am talking about things, uh, about events. We're very pro-free speech on this channel, and uh, a wide range of arguments are accepted, um, with the caveat we don't like anything particularly genocidal. We don't really like that sort of thing. I don't think it'll come up on this topic. Um, but uh, generally speaking, what we are... Uh, Pretty open-minded. You can say anything you want about ideas. You can say anything about what you want about me. But what you have to do is be a um, uh, what you have to be is respectful to each other. You have to uh, treat each other with respect and not disrupt the chat. No spamming of the chat. No insulting of people. No ganging up on people. And uh, Loga Cool Extreme, the moderator, is there to enforce that. Uh, there is no appeal from the court of Loga. If you're doing something inappropriate, he will warn you. And if you continue to keep doing it, he will block you. And uh, there's, no, there's no coming back from that. Um, if you want to participate with Super Chats, I'm very, very grateful uh, that you, know, you help keep this channel going. Um, but uh, that will be at the end. I will respond to all Super Chats and as many other questions as I can within the two-hour Time frame, but I'll do that after the presentation. I've got a you know a half hour, forty five minute presentation. I'm going to do first on China and the Solomon Islands, and then if you could hold off with your super chats and your questions until the Q and A period afterwards. I can't see anything that's going on in the chat right now. I don't have that mental bandwidth. So what happened um, after being rumored and talked about uh, for about a month and a half, two months now? Um, this past week, China and the Solomon Islands signed a security deal. We don't know what's in that security deal. A draft of the deal was leaked about a month back. You can look at that. I believe I've got a link to uh, that leaked draft in the description uh, of this, uh, this video. You can look at, at, at what that was. We don't know. We don't know what the final draft was. Maybe the final draft is even more you know, banal and benign than the leaked draft. And to be clear, the leak draft is fairly, fairly banal. If you believe that we live in a world with, um, you know, relatively equal competitors uh, bouncing off of each other, um, then the deal that China signed with the Solomon Islands, you know, relatively equal sovereign countries bouncing off of each other, um, and the U.S. and China are in sort of a, a Russia or in a real competition, 
then there should be nothing in that deal that bothers you. But that is not, in fact, the world that we live in. We live in a world of the U.S. world system, where the United States calls the shots and essentially gives a rather rather clear ultimatum to every country in the world to sort of submit or die. Um, and uh, in this case, I think what we're seeing here is the most concrete example of the Chinese refusing um, that deal um, to submit or die. Um, I think that folks talk about how there's a lot of things um, uh, that China does or has done that can be construed as sort of uh, the, the opening shot of a Cold War or as the first Cold War move from China, which is how I see this Solomon Islands thing. And they, they point out that, oh, no, no, there's all these things, you know, China and Pakistan, one belt, one road, death trap diplomacy, um, you know, the, the, the South Asia, you know, the South China Sea. There's all these things that China's been doing for decades. All, everyone is constantly flipping out about that. Uh, you know, in the United States, in foreign affairs and geopolitics stuff. Well, I would say no, actually. I'd say most of that stuff is mostly self-defense, um, either self-defense or is covered in such a way, such a ridiculously inflammatory way in the United States as to sort of blow things out of all proportion, specifically uh, the amount of money that China puts into um, building infrastructure in Africa, the One Belt, One Road, uh, program, which by and large is very benign and even quite helpful. Not to say that there isn't corruption, that there isn't waste uh, in uh, Chinese aid programs and infrastructure deals across the world. You, you may, may not be surprised to hear that there's a lot of corruption, waste, and failure in U.S. aid programs over the past half century as well. Um, Definitely things that are wrong with it, definitely questions you can ask about, well, that's a lot of de debt for these countries to be taking on, as we're certainly seeing um, in Sri Lanka. But I think the way that those things are covered is just so far out of proportion to the actual threat that they might provide. It's mostly the United States and Europe objecting to somebody else attempting to take the role of a helpful, uh, you know, patriarchal type power in the world more generally. So I think that's mostly BS. As far as what China is doing in the South China Sea, we can just take a quick look at a map here. Um, and if you will take a look, the, the most, um, the most uh, advanced and, and uh, aggressive interpretation that China has uh, is, I believe, called the nine dash line. And you might have noticed, did I actually make? No, I guess that's eight dashes, oops. Um, I made a uh, very poor representation of what China's claims are there on this map. You've got uh, China claiming all these islands in the South China Sea that get into Vietnamese, uh, Philippine, and I guess even, is that, is that Malaysian? Um, uh, territorial waters. Um, and uh, that is the, the, the big bone of contention, the things that we've been talking about uh, for almost, I guess, a decade now, uh, China's big dispute with everybody else uh, in Asia. That's where that is. And then if you look all the way over here, you know, practically on the other, sorry about the siren, practically on the other side of, um, you know, most Asian countries, uh, you've got the Solomon Islands, uh, to, to the, um, the Solomon Islands to the east and north of Australia. I mean, this is a huge, huge leap uh, for China in terms of security. Um, I think you can definitely say that uh, China's claims with the Nine Dash Line are aggressive or what have you, but in the context of the U.S. pivot to Asia, which is something we have been doing for a decade now since Obama's second term, uh, the, the, the U.S. pivot to Asia... Um, China going and dumping concrete uh, in the middle of the South China Sea and create, you know, claiming uh, islands and creating islands out of nowhere. It's actually quite sort of a, a weak attempt at self-defense when you consider all of the aggressive things that were happening with the pivot to Asia. Probably chief amongst them would be convincing Japan to give up uh, its sort of official pacifism uh, in 2015 or thereabouts, uh, carving off, didn't last, but carving off uh, Myanmar uh, as a, you know from being a Chinese client to being more of a U.S. client, uh, 
Um, and of course, uh, something the Biden administration has doubled down on massively, the militarization of Australia. So when you consider all of those moves, the sort of uh, the nine dash line, the uh, doesn't seem like that big a deal, um, um, really. And I, at least that's not the way that I, I don't see it as much of a big deal. I don't see as see one belt, one road as much of a big deal. I do see a Chinese presence in the Solomon Islands as a huge, huge deal. And to be clear, this isn't, um, again, this isn't something that's a concern for this decade. This isn't something that's a concern uh, in the short term. But it is something that's a concern if you believe, as I do believe, that this is going to be a long-term strategic competition. Um, and to have a Chinese presence in the Solomon Islands is a really big deal. Um, I think that the fundamental mindset of Washington, D.C. here is absolutely objectionable. Um, it's, you know, this idea that, well, nobody can have any, you know, Solomon Islands, sure, 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 Solomon Islands, they're a, they're a, they're a sovereign nation, they're allowed to make their own choices, but they can't make this choice, um, you know, can strike many people as uh, sort of brutal or unfair or um, um, uh, brutal or unfair, but you can't say that it's uncharacteristic. This is standard um, uh, operating procedure for the United States. You know, we are the ones who are allowed to build up client states, um, as we, of course, most famously have done so in Ukraine on the border uh, with Russia, uh, to extraordinarily positive effect for U.S. defense contractors. Um, that's the kind of behavior that the United States is allowed to be involved in because it's pro-freedom. Um, while uh, the uh, Chinese are no definitely not allowed uh, to do that sort of thing. And you can see the beginnings of an attempt to do so with the Solomon Islands. And to be clear, this is not going to launch World War III. This is not, um, uh, this is not an immediate threat because China simply doesn't have the capability that the United States has, even within um, Asia. Though, of course, that's somewhat reductive. I mean, you look at this map, within Asia. I mean, Asia is a tremendously complex and heavily populated uh, place. Uh, you know, this is a huge leap of ch for, uh, by China out of its traditional um, traditional area of, of military interest or what have you. Um, so to say it's within Asia is, is kind of is incredibly reductive. This is a huge, huge deal. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very big thing. That China is doing, and it isn't something that it has the capability to back up quite yet, but it is very much very similar to what the United States is doing in Ukraine. Um, of course, it's not uh, directed against Ukraine, it is directed against Australia. Um, and also, this is very clear retaliation uh, for something that happened last fall, AUKUS, which I talked about, the Australia-UK-US agreement to provide nuclear uh, propelled submarines to Australia. A lot of folks made a big deal. Oh, no, you can't call this proliferation because it's, you know, you have to understand they are nuclear propelled submarines, not nuclear armed, because, you know, that would make Australia automatically a nuclear country, which would be uh, a, an incredible violation of non-proliferation treaties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, a, you know, these are just nuclear pro propelled subs that we're going to give to Australia over the next decade or so. Um, and I find that distinction to be kind of ridiculous um, when you consider the infrastructure that Australia is going to have to adopt. Um, it, it would not be difficult uh, for um, Australia to make the choice, once they have nuclear-propelled submarines, to throw some warheads on there. The infrastructure that Australia is going to have to build, you know, the enrichment uh, uh, that it's going to have to get into uh, to provide the energy sources of a nuclear-propelled Submarine are actually quite similar uh, to the enrichment, or I think dramatically more advanced, don't quote me on that, than the enrichment that Iran has done. Uh, so it's a, it, we've essentially agreed to do nuclear proliferation to Australia, and even leaving aside the actual submarines that we're supposed to be building for Australia, uh, the agreement includes U.S. basing, basing for U.S. nuclear-propelled and armed submarines. Um, so... This, again, if you're looking at this in the context of the 2020s, this Chinese move almost seems pitiful. 
what the security agreement contemplates with the Solomon Islands is some basic participation, uh, collaboration between China and the Solomon Islands, sort of along the lines of what uh, the United States Special Forces have with, gosh, uh, two dozen African countries, but a little bit further because the Solomon Islands has a history of uh, extreme unrest, um, you know, riots that also have a history of targeting Chinese nationals. So now, if the Solomon Islands requests it, um, Chinese security forces can now be present on the Solomon Islands. So this is, you know, maybe we'll send some cops over is very different from nuclear proliferation to Australia with uh, some of the scariest weapons of war humanity has ever uh, uh, invented uh, to the tune of $70 billion. Very different from, gee, if you, you know, if the people of the Solomon Islands are burning down Chinese businesses, maybe the Chinese will uh, send over some military police. It's a very different, you know, sort of knife to the gunfight type of deal here. But you have to understand this isn't, we're not operating in a context, we've never been operating in a context where, you know, we have different, you know, competition between sovereign countries, et cetera, et cetera. No, we live in the U.S. world system. And though on any measure of justice or sanity, uh, China making this deal with um, the Solomon Islands is nowhere near as threatening as the U.S. giving nuclear submarines to Australia, not quite explicitly, but very clearly as subtext to be directed at China. You know, those are those are nowhere near equivalent things, but we don't actually live in a Westphalian sovereign system. We live in a system where the United States is in charge, and this is a tremendous, tremendous challenge against that. The Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, uh, Manasa Sogavare, I apologize for the pronouncing of that, maintains that, no, 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 there's no military bases involved here. And we've got, I think probably because of some leading questions, not an actual statement from U.S. officials, but we've got the implication that the United States uh, states that they would not necessarily uh, rule out a military intervention <laughs> if there was uh, an actual Chinese military base being built. The Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands maintains there will be no military base built. But you have to understand this is how these things start. This is how you take very vague language and you can do an incredible amount with it. China and the Solomon Islands now have an agreement on security cooperation. And whether it's under Sogavare or a Solomon Islands Prime Minister three, five, 20, 25 years from now, they've got this agreement. And, you know, a couple tens of hundreds of millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how the Solomon Islands uh, economy continues to develop, you know, placed uh, in the bank account of the prime minister of the Solomon Islands uh, circa 2035, uh, 2045, um, can make a military base happen very quickly under the status of this agreement here. Um, so it's quite, um, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And the United States has really screwed up uh, by allowing this to happen. I think we should talk a little bit more about the Solomon Islands specifically. I've really enjoyed uh, the past couple of days uh, being able to just sort of dive in on the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, uh, this sort of general area. Um, I'm still completely new to it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't think the Solomon Islands is technically Micronesia or um, you know, what you call this region as a whole. Uh, these islands are something that doesn't necessarily come up a ton in, in the study of history, the study of um, geopolitics, uh, but they're about to start coming up a lot more. Uh, so we should probably talk about the Solomon Islands. Uh, this is sort of the first, uh, one of the, the Solomon Islands is sort of that first jump off of Papua New Guinea into this extraordinarily diverse and deeply impressive world of Pacific Islands that go much, much further than, than the Solomon Islands. My understanding is that the Solomon Islands itself were sort of populated before the last ice age, might have actually had some land connections to Papua New Guinea at that point. Um, 
So I was sort of, I was wondering as I was looking into this, this is how ignorant I was. I was like, oh, are the Solomon Islands like that Disney film, um, uh, uh, Moana, you know, like this, this sort of uh, uh, characteristic island culture, these heroic sailors um, going off uh, to the edge of the unknown. Um, and actually, upon reflection, it seems actually maybe not. Uh, that, that, sort of, that sort of Samoan, Tahitian um, uh, um, culture is much further off into, into the Pacific, into the, into the, um, uh, into the east, uh, uh, further into the Pacific. Whereas the Solomon Islands, there may have been land bridges with Papua New Guinea, uh, before the last ice age, the Solomon Islands have been populated, I believe, for significantly longer periods of time than um, the Pacific Island, the further east Pacific Islands. Though I believe that has very little, um, I believe that has very little archaeological backing. We just don't really know because they haven't gotten a ton of um, attention. Um, the Solomon Islands. Uh, the Solomon Islands first had to deal with the Europeans in the 1500s, 1600s, but remained very, very much out of the way. Um, they uh, were not of much concern, uh, finally, and sort of at the height of the British world system in the uh, late 19th century. They became, in the late 1800s, they became an object of some context contention between Germany and Britain because, frankly, uh, they were some of the only areas left in the world that hadn't already been carved up uh, by the British uh, uh, or the French or other sort of um, imperial powers. And Germany unified in 1870. It desperately wanted to have its place in the sun to be part of this imperial game. Um, and uh, the Solomon Islands, I believe, actually were never directly under the Germans, um, but the Solomon Islands became an object of geopolitical contention uh, for the first time in the 1880s and 1890s as Germany and uh, the British Empire were sort of sorting out who owned what, who had, um, who was able to carve off which piece of property. Um, and I think actually the Solomon Islands had been quite lucky um, for a very long period of time to not be um, that important in the geopolitical calculus of the Europeans. It just, they just simply did not matter. The fact that they were only colonized in the 1880s um, is an indication of just how little significance they had. Uh, they were, of course, on trade routes to some degree since the 1500s. I'm sure they were, haven't done very detailed history. I'm sure there's all kinds of negative impacts from the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Dutch and et cetera, et cetera. But they were sort of on the margins. That lucky period in the Solomon, Solomon Islands existence ended uh, in 1942 and ended quite dramatically. Um, the Pacific theater of World War II is definitely something that gets a lot less attention uh, than the Western theater, but it was a truly, truly epic struggle between uh, Japan and the United States. I'm always struck when I look at the Pacific Theater, the way that it, it seems to me the closest, I'm, I'm a big science fiction aficionado, and it seems to me the closest to what we would, we would see in sort of a science fiction space battle in that the, the absolute cutting edge technologies of the 1940s were used to bring incredible destruction um, to some of the most hostile environments on the planet, uh, the Pacific, these islands that, well, well I mean, there were uh, many people, the Solomon Islanders among them, who had uh, figured out how to thrive in these environments. However, neither the Japanese nor uh, the Americans had any real idea and uh, were, uh, in many senses, I think for, uh, quite legitimately, I think Japanese, despite the horrific nature of the fighting, I think vastly more Japanese and possibly a significant chunk of Americans as well were killed by the environment, uh, by diseases, uh, uh, than they were by um, actual fighting. Regardless, the Pacific theater of World War II is this fascinating, fascinating area of study. And if you're familiar with classic U.S. documentaries like Victory at Sea, et cetera, et cetera, a significant chunk of what they are discussing is the Solomon Islands, or the Solomon Islands and its environment. 
Um, if you look at this map here, this is another terrible map that I've created. Um, this is my rough attempt of uh, illustrating the uh, greatest extent of the Japanese Empire. In 1941, uh, Japan launched the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, but also immensely uh, quickly, at the same time, rampaged through uh, most of, I suppose we would call that Southeast Asia. Um, they attacked uh, the Philippines uh, and Hawaii at roughly the same time. The Philippines at that point was part of, it was explicitly part uh, U.S. territory, a part of the U.S. empire, um, and uh, the Japanese pushed uh, MacArthur and the U.S. military out of the Philippines, uh, took uh, modern uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, um, uh, the Malay Peninsula, uh, shocking uh, conquest of Singapore, which at the point at that point was a British, um, uh, a uh, at that point was a British stronghold meant to be the fortress of the British Empire. The Japanese made very quick work of it, and were more. Uh, I would, I think it's debatable. Were probably more uh, defeated by the geography, uh, or were more hampered by the geography and the difficulty of the environment than they were by any. Um, European or American military forces in this first great onrushing of the Japanese Empire in uh, the end of 1941 and the first months of 1942. So this purple line is the greatest extent of uh, the uh, Japanese imperial uh, victories in, um, I suppose, 1942, mid-1942. And the Solomon Islands were very much uh, a part of that conflict. Guadalcanal, um, which is, I believe, uh, any uh, rudimentary uh, uh, student of World War II is aware of Guadalcanal. It was a tremendous uh, battle between the Japanese military and the United States Marines, I believe. Uh, sort of the first, that along with the Battle of Midway, which was more of a naval and aerial battle, is sort of the first turning of the tide where the United States began marching its way uh, up the islands to Japan, at top of the map there. Uh, Guadalcanal is uh, where the island in the Solomon Islands, which holds the capital of the Solomon Islands today. A lot of World War II era development of, um, is it Honoria? I'm sorry, the capital, the name of the capital of the Solomon Islands uh, escapes me, but was developed massively by uh, the United States in World War Two. At the time, and this is a key point, at the time uh, of um, World War II, all of these islands on top of Australia here were to some extent parts of European empire. The idea of uh, Japan being able to open a base on any of these islands uh, in the 1930s uh, would have been completely out of the question because they were all, um, after, I'd, I'd forgotten to mention during World War I, uh, not the Solomon Islands, but I believe the, um, I think there's actually islands called the Bismarck Islands, uh, um, directly to the, uh, between Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, which are circled on this map, I have the Bismarck Islands, which were part of the German Empire. Apparently one of the first great victories for the Allies in World War I was when Australia and troops uh, occupied uh, the German um, German Pacific Islands there. Um, so it was also part of the British Empire. So this was all British Empire, Dutch Empire, and mostly British and Dutch Empire, U.S. Empire in the Philippines. This was all firmly controlled. Um, we're in a different environment now where we have sovereign countries. Um, I do want to say briefly on the World War II topic, um, the consequences in loss of human life for the islanders here were absolutely immense, uh, horrific. Uh, some of the most intense battles of World War II were fought on these Pacific islands with uh, heavy, heavy involvement of aerial bombing, uh, even battleships, uh, just, just really, really, really horrifically costly environments. Um, I was surprised this morning researching, I was just trying to find any data at all about the costs in lives to Solomon Islanders, and it was it just simply isn't there uh, as an indicator indication of just how far beneath the notice of um, 
uh, sort of U.S. sources the Solomon Islands have always been that despite the lovingly detailed uh, descriptions of uh, the campaigns in the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, um, uh, the many battles, Papua New Guinea, etc., etc., despite loving descriptions of those battles, uh, there's no mention of the impact on islanders. In some cases, I was looking in detail, was it Peleliu? I mean, there really weren't that many folks living there. Um, but that's not the case for all of the Solomon Islands. That's not the case for all of Papua New Guinea. But there's no description of what actually happened to um, uh, the people who lived there. We know from... Um, we know from very different uh, World War II Pacific conflicts, I mean, half a world away, thousands of miles away, that the costs of the kinds of fighting that were done there were immense. I saw estimates this morning that Guam, uh, a U.S. territory at the time that was taken by the Japanese and then retaken in 1944, estimates that 5 to 10 percent, 5 to 10 percent of the indigenous pop Chamorro population of Guam were killed in 1944. Um, I mean, that's Poland numbers. That's, um, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty horrific. Uh, Okinawa, um, 50% of the indigenous Okinawans uh, were killed. A fully half. I think 300,000 Okinawans lived in Okinawa before uh, the U.S. attack. Um, and 150,000 were left thereafter. So that's, those are the kinds of consequences of the fighting uh, that we're talking about in World War II. Um, so while the Solomon Islands and most of the rest of these Pacific Islands sort of fell off the map after World War II in terms of international concern, um, I think to some extent they should have been happy for that. Um, again, the fact that all of these territories over Australia um, during the last real um, era of uh, Pacific dispute or war, um, sort of the 1930s, the 1940s, the fact that all of these areas were controlled by European empires is, of course, a very bad thing. But from the context of Australian security, um, it was uh, a sort of a safer situation. Can you imagine how different um, this picture would have looked if um, the Japanese had been able to take a few islands in um, the Solomon Islands um, in the 1920s or the 1930s, if they'd had the capacity to build up um, serious naval infrastructure um, on those islands in the context of peacetime? Um, that's the kind of question. Um, this map here of the high watermark of the Japanese Empire in 1942, um, what if they'd already been there? You know, what if they'd already been at the high watermark? What if they'd already had resources staged there? I mean, this is where the Solomon Islands is where the Japanese were stopped. Um, in the context of a conflict between the United States and China, in which uh, we're very confident uh, Australia would be on the U.S.'s side, we're now looking at a situation where China, potentially, again, this, the, the, there's, there's no real indication of, you know, China simply doesn't have the power at this point to um, set up uh, a, a landing, you know, a, a place from which to, to uh, conquer Australia from. But what about the 2040s or the 2050s or the 2060s? This is sort of the long-term considerations here. And this is why I believe the Washington, D.C. freakout about the Solomon Islands is more sincere and more, um, more uh, worthy of being taken seriously than uh, really anything I've seen before. I really do think that this is sort of the first Cold War move that China has made. Um, the Solomon Islands didn't become independent until 1978. The year before, up until the year before I was born, the Solomon Islands were part of the British Empire. Not the British Commonwealth. I guess technically they would have been part of the British Commonwealth at that point as well. But, you know, they were not, you know, part of the, the sort of, oh, you know, we've got Queen Elizabeth on our, on our currency. No, it was part of the British Empire until 1978, um, a year before I was born, um, which is something I was not aware of. I mean, that would make it one of the, you know, along with uh, Hong Kong and a few other places, one of, the, one of the later holdouts of the British Empire. 
Um, did not realize that it lasted quite that long. Uh, so the Solomon Islands are a very poor place. They are a uh, very ethnically diverse uh, place. I think it's uh, you know, six or seven hundred thousand people. Um, and I believe I've read this figure. It seems hard to credit, but it's something like 900 islands. I don't know how many of those islands are actually inhabited. But um, there's certainly serious ethnic divisions in the 90s, just sort of in the first 20 years uh, of independence. Uh, those ethnic considerations came to the fore. Uh, there was very serious unrest, so serious that uh, the um, government of the Solomon Islands invited uh, Australian and New Zealand uh, military or policing forces into the Solomon Islands. And I have not done detailed research on this, but I was surprised to learn that apparently between 2003 and 2017, uh, the Solomon Islands, I think the term occupation would be very pejorative, um, but to some degree, I mean, the Australians and uh, the New Zealand military forces were present, uh, maintaining the peace in the Solomon Islands until 2017. Um, I don't know if they were at the same level, but my understanding is that in 2003, when the operation started, there were you know, 10 to 20,000 troops, Australian troops, uh, carrying out this, um, this sort of operation. Um, so it is, it is an interesting place, um, and I think that um, that should give another indication of just how, how alarming it might be um, for um, Australia, um, and by extension for the United States, to see China taking a security position here. Because this is not a country where, oh, you know, we've got some vague, um, vague discussion of security cooperation, and there's going to be some kind of... Uh, um, you know, vague discussion of security cooperation, there's going to be some kind of weapon sales or something like that. This is a country that has had the kind of experience that the draft deal that has been leaked, uh, you know, contemplates within the past six years. Australian troops only left in 2017, so the idea that they could potentially be um, replaced uh, by Chinese troops um, in some other... Um, context of instability is really quite uh, unnerving to the Australians. And obviously, as uh, we are all aware, in terms of COVID, in terms of Russia-Ukraine wars effect on energy prices and food prices, uh, the possibility of a poor country like so the Solomon Islands experiencing very real unrest in um, uh, the coming years is very, very high. Um, so this is, this is an interesting choice uh, by Prime Minister uh, Manasa Sogovare. I think it's, it's an interesting bet, um, and I think a, um, um, I think a risky bet, uh, I think one that is likely to pay off in the short term, but who's to say how it pays off in the long term, by choosing to play, and this is not something... I think this is something that is being portrayed in Washington, D.C. as sinister somehow, but I, I think it is a completely valid choice for a sovereign country to make, but it is a risky choice. I think that uh, Sogavare uh, sees the way that the Solomon Islands have been neglected um, and ignored when they are not um, a, a strategic issue. And by making the Solomon Islands a huge strategic issue. By making it now, I would argue, one of the more strategically important um, areas in Asia, um, to be clear, um, by, by putting the, the, the Solomon Islands in that position, I think Sogavari is making a very real calculation that there are going to be resources coming down to the Solomon Islands now, both from uh, the Chinese side and the U.S. side. Um, I think there's no question that... Uh, you know, probably uh, rents in the capital have probably gone up, uh, gone up five percent uh, since this deal was announced. As we'll have an influx, uh, I'm only half joking in the in saying this, um, an influx of uh, spies. Quite frankly, I mean, sort of a sort of a uh, not quite uh, Cold War Berlin, but th this is this is the sorts of things we're going to be seeing in Solomon Island in the Solomon Islands. Real competition, real efforts to corrupt uh, Solomon Islands politicians. The Solomon Islands have a parliamentary system. Uh, 
uh, modeled on Britain, um, unsurprisingly, as a recent British uh, colony. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a risky choice for Sogavari personally, of course. Um, you know, <laughs> expect a revolution of dignity, perhaps. Um, but um, I think for his country, it's actually probably a pretty, uh, I mean, I think we all hope and pray that it won't come down to a sort of uh, World War II style battle for Pacific Islands. The fact that China and the United States and now Australia are all uh, nuclear powers makes it seem much less likely. Uh, so yeah, maybe this is the right choice for the Solomon Islands to sort of put themselves on the front line uh, to this extent. Maybe it's a safe bet that there won't be an actual uh, um, war that will impose the sorts of costs that were imposed on the Solomon Islands in the 1940s. Um, but it is, it is interesting. Um, I think, okay, I've done about 45 minutes. I'd want to close with why we're seeing such a high, um, a high level of panic about this in uh, the United States, in Washington, D.C. And because that's because, uh, I'm getting a little ranty here, because this is just such an extraordinary indictment of the lack of seriousness we have in Washington, D.C. I am somebody who does not believe the pivot to Asia was necessary, does not believe the new Cold War was necessary. I believe it's a choice that the United States made. Um, I think, however, with this decision, it's becoming clearer and clearer. I've run videos in the past talking about it's so strange the way China just simply refuses to take the bait. Um, the way that China has has continuously refused to get into proxy wars with the United States has always tried to stay back and and, and restrain itself. This is this strikes me as um, China's restraint falling away, um, as China beginning to engage in this new Cold War that the U.S. has desperately been trying to push on China for at least a decade now. Um, is not. A U.S. policy I've supported. It is not uh, something that I think is a good idea for the United States, for humanity in general. I think it's actually tremendously sad that uh, the U.S. is, uh, the United States government is held hostage to the interests of weapons manufacturers to the extent that it is. Um, however, if we're going to do it, do it. Like, do it right. Like, I do believe that competition between the United States and China is inevitable. It didn't have to be this stupid. It didn't have to be this quick. It didn't have to be on this um, brutal level of sort of, oh, are we going to carve off this for military bases or that to military bases? But diplomatic business competition between China and the United States was absolutely inevitable. And if it could have been kept out of this military sphere, not even necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, two, two countries leading the world, attempting to outdo each other in human achievement, that would have been great. Um, but this Solomon Islands thing is such an incredible failure because we've been talking about bipartisan, every administration since the second Obama term, we've been talking about a pivot to Asia. We've been talking about how important Asia is. We've talked about how Asia is the future. This is what we care about. And since the beginning, since Hillary Clinton being Secretary of State, we've been pushing for a militarized approach to this. We've been pushing for a very explicitly uh, imperial, um, we're carving off, we're putting these countries in our camps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it is absolutely gobsmacking to me that we could take this approach Specifically, the Biden administration could do this AUKUS nuclear submarine deal with Australia um, last, um, last fall. We could do all of that and not be paying attention to the Solomon Islands because the amount of money that, uh, that China is bringing to the table in the Solomon Islands is paltry um, uh, as, a, as a preliminary step to... Um, you know, uh, prior to this military agreement, China did a um, basically uh, bribed uh, the Solomon Islands to get them to recognize China rather than Taiwan. And it was like five hundred million dollars. It was pennies. It was pennies. So we are putting 70 billion dollars between the, uh, the Australians, the UK and the US 
are putting up $70 billion to put nuclear submarines in Australia, and we couldn't get it together to promise the Solomon Islands $500 million just to, you know, stay in our camp? I mean, it's extraordinarily neg extraordinary negligence, extraordinary negligence. We've been talking about how much we care about competition in Asia, and we couldn't, like, we, we couldn't, like, keep, uh, you know, USAID with a somewhat larger presence in the Solomon Islands. Like, this is basic, basic stuff. The United States, Washington, D.C., is claiming that it's fighting this, you know, multidimensional new conflict with China. And we just let the Solomon Islands just float away. Like the entire northeastern flank of Australia is potentially moving towards the Chinese camp because we don't have any diplomacy. Uh, one of the most extraordinary facts is that we closed the Solomon Islands, the U.S. Embassy to the Solomon Islands, we closed it in 1992. We consolidated it. You know, now the, the embassy, you know, focused on the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu and uh, you know, I think a, a couple other Pacific islands as well. It's just, it's just gobsmacking. Like, like we closed our embassy in 1992, and I think a lot of the panic you're seeing in Washington D.C. is that people in Washington D.C. don't want to people to focus on just what this highlights about the fundamental lack of seriousness about the U.S. approach to Asia. If the U.S. is serious about competition in Asia then unfortunately, maybe there's some role for military stuff. But primarily and vastly more important is foreign aid, diplomatic posture, business relations. You know, the, the, if this is truly a multidimensional competition with China, we need to be committed, competing on all these dimensions. And it's clear we're not doing any of that. All we're doing is looking for ways to build up defense contracts. So we've got $70 billion to hand out to um, the people bribing U.S. congressmen um, to build nuclear submarines, but we don't have pennies by comparison to make sure that the entire northeastern flank of Australian defense doesn't just sort of float off into the Chinese camp. It's truly, um, truly ridiculous, and I think really highlights what Washington, D.C. really cares about. Even on the principles that I generally regret, uh, sorry, that I generally reject this idea that the United States has to do military competition with everybody. But even on its own terms, pretending that competition with Russia and China is actually an important, valuable thing that the U.S. does, Washington, D.C. is failing utterly to do that. And that's why you're seeing so much yelping um, in Washington, D.C. right now is because I think people realize just how badly they've fucked this up on their own terms, on the, 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 their own mythology it completely discredits the mythology that anybody in Washington, D.C. is actually serious about confronting China on any dimension that doesn't involve more bribery, more defense industry bribery for Congress people. Um, so, yeah, I hope that was helpful. Um, that's, I think, the extent of my presentation. Um, and now it is time for question and answer. Do we have questions? Uh, what would we like me to talk about for the next hour? I, I see. Is that just the one super chat from Alex Alpine? Um, yeah, Alex Alpine has a super chat. Thank you, sir. Uh, could one of the islands vote to separate like Bougainville and become directly Chinese controlled? Um, no, I wouldn't expect that to happen. I mean, why would they vote to be directly Chinese controlled? I think that um, everyone in the world um, has a very serious interest in its uh, in, in their sovereignty. Um, and uh, I think a more interesting question is, could one of the uninhabited, um, could one of the uninhabited, uh, so Bougainville fought to separate itself from Papua New Guinea. Is that, is that correct? And is Bougainville now, uh, Bougainville is now independent. Bougainville is in between um, the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, I believe. Um, and I was just, in the potted history I was reading, it's, uh, the uh, Bougainville independence was very uh, important in actually destabilizing the Solomon Islands because a lot of uh, rebels um, and the Papua New Guinea military were sort of fighting in Solomon Islands territory and uh, forcing population transfers uh, that created ethnic tensions within the Solomon Islands. Um, but yeah, the idea of uh, 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 one of these islands somehow voting to be Chinese controlled seems kind of seems very hard to credit 
Um, and I don't think, I just don't think that's really how the world works anymore, if that makes any sense. Like, I just don't think that's, um, you know, it's not like there's going to be a, a Chinese, a Chinese island off the northeast coast of, um, uh, of, of Australia. What there could be is a long-term lease for a Chinese naval base. Um, so I think that um, the Alex Alpine, what you're suggesting there, strikes me as a real affront to sort of principles of sovereignty that most of the world have has embraced, um, and that um, China is is nominally very serious about. Um, so I mean, I think. Uh, are you talking about like a Panama possibility where the United States basically, you know, sponsored a new government uh, for Panama so we could get a sweeter detail, you know, because Panama was part of Colombia uh, prior to the 20th century. Um, and we essentially sponsored a rebel government in Panama so we could get a sweetheart deal for the, um, for the Panama Canal. Um, yeah, I guess that kind of scenario is a possibility, but I don't think that China has to engage in that level of, you know, chicanery, that level of transparently imperial stuff, if they've already got a security agreement with the Solomon Islands, then over the coming decades of growing Chinese power, growing uh, Chinese capability, um, it's not a, it's not too much of a, um, not too much of a stretch that they could just, um, uh, you know, you know, have a base on one of these islands for, or numerous of these islands for military purposes. Um, and it, you know, in the context of just a positive, pleasant deal with the Solomon Islands. Um, China is scared of the United States, no question. Uh, just one quick question. I talk a lot about how I don't believe uh, naval ships are important or worthwhile anymore. Um, there's a lot of propaganda in U.S. press talking about how we need 500 ships. I think we just saw in the Black Sea what you know how useful uh, battleships are currently. Um, a lot of people will tell you, no, 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 no. The U.S. is vastly more U.S. Navy is vastly more competent and would never ever you know be as stupid and 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 careless enough to lose a ship the way that um, the Russians did because you know the Russians don't know what they're doing. Yada yada. Well, you know, uh, pretty sure uh, the most famous Pacific. Naval news of the past five years for the United States is that uh, some of our destroyers tend to run into each other. Um, so maybe actually, yeah, yeah anyway, uh, I'm not somebody who believes we need 500 ships. I tend to think of capital ships as uh, the sorts of things that are likely to end up as a billion dollar undersea sculpture within the first 10, 15 minutes of uh, a World War III. Um, however, uh, the Solomon Islands, like Taiwan, uh, are aircraft carriers that don't sink. Um, so uh, we've figured out, I believe, that most of the war fighting platforms of World War II are essentially useless. I think, uh, uh, I think Putin has been providing an abject lesson on how useless tanks are, um, how useless battleships are, um, and I think fighter pilots as well, um, though we haven't gotten too much illustration of that from Ukraine yet. Um, but I think they're useless as well. Uh, islands, land, chunks of land, unsinkable aircraft carriers uh, are still very, very useful. Um, and that's sort of the importance of the Solomon Islands. Um, the idea that uh, China could have assets in place on unsinkable aircraft carriers just to the northeast of Australia prior to the war. Um, so sorry, I don't have uh, Alex Alpine. I don't have uh, too much detail on what happened with Bougainville. So, um, Toad Films, instead of increasing trade with India, is the U.S. more interested in propping up countries like Vietnam, Philippines, and Indonesia that are non-nuclear and actually really big, but not to the point of being able to surpass the United States? I don't see India surpassing the United States as a realistic concern for this half of this century. Um, I think there need to be needs to be serious uh, changes with India, um, the um, uh, for us to be at all concerned about um, uh, India surpassing the United States economically uh, by even the twenty sixties or the twenty seventies, um, and also even if there were Toad films, I don't really think that would be a concern. Um, I think that one of the more sensible. 
um, strategies for the United States, I think advocated by Stephen Walt and John Mearshammer to a degree, is uh, sort of uh, offshore balancing. Um, the idea being that uh, if India, you know, the richer India becomes, the better, because the richer India is, the more capable it is of balancing against China. Um, so I don't really see any context where the United States loses from a richer India. Of course, if China and India were to decide that they had common cause, um, then, well, that would be pretty horrifying now, wouldn't it? Um, but there's such immense differences between China and India culturally and historically, and just the, the simple basic fact of um, to have two countries that share a border as extensive as they do, um, and to both have aspiration, both have aspirations as sort of world powers. Um, it, it's 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 really hard to look at that and not think of uh, France and Germany in the nineteenth century, which is of course terrifying for two nuclear, you know, to to think that way about two nuclear powers. But I don't think there's any, even if. Um, even if, you know, India were even less friendly to the United States than it is today, um, I think we would have to see a stronger, richer India as within our strategic interests because of the potential of competition with China. Um, and I think that's always going to be the case. But uh, it's not an either or, really. Um, we can... Um, and honestly, there are many more obstacles to trade with India than there are with Vietnam and Indonesia, um, sort of legal, cultural obstacles with India, just the sheer size of India, the sheer unwieldy nature of, you know, attempting to build industry in, in India. It just, it's simply, um, it has defeated many, many, many a person, whereas Vietnam, um, Indonesia, Philippines are... Um, Philippines to lesser degrees, though I understand there's a lot of infrastructure going up recently. Um, but Vietnam and Indonesia are much easier places to work with. Um, so I see them not out of you know concerted U.S. policy or philosophy being more supported by the United States. It's just that they're 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 easier for U.S. business to work with. Um, so yeah. Do 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 do. Um, Staro Pulsaro, if this agreement turns out to be benign and not the start of a new Cold War, then what was this agreement made for? Well, the agreement has real, um, uh, real roots there. Um, the, as I said, there have been recent riots in uh, the Solomon Islands that have targeted uh, Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, there is a Chinese presence, there's Chinese nationals on the Solomon Islands attempting to do business um, that have been targeted. Um, so I think... It's obviously not everything to it. Um, the Chinese government famously has a very ambivalent uh, attitude towards overseas Chinese, uh, sort of seeing them as, to some degree, fundamentally, you know, uh, traitorous in some ways, if they're not uh, very, very, very supportive of uh, Chinese policies. Um, so this idea that, you know, oh, China just really cares about its, its foreign nationals um, in the Solomon Islands, uh, I think is actually, I mean, it's a, it's an argument that sounds credible, um, and and you know it, it, it's hard to be like, oh, you guys are lying. Um, but um, I think it's uh, I think it strains credibility to to say that oh, you know they're 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 doing this detailed security deal with the Solomon Islands, uh, the famous World War II battlefield off the northeast of of uh, Australia. Um, uh, yeah, it seems like kind of a detailed new sort of thing. Um, also, in that draft agreement that was released, again, we don't know what the final agreement looks like. Um, uh, Sogovare, Prime Minister, uh, Solomon Islands Prime Minister Sogovare refuses to release it. Um, uh, there's a lot of language in there that sounds very similar to the way that China talks about its military base in Djibouti. Uh, sort of, oh, you know, just logistical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, merely logistics or what have you. It's... Um, Anyway, but I guess that's not what your actual question is. Your question is, if this agreement turns out to be benign and not the start of a new Cold War, then what was this agreement made for? Um, well, I don't, I mean, I think, I mean, Star Pulse I think we're in a new Cold War. Um, and I think that, I mean, the U.S. has been waging it uh, quite viciously for a solid decade now. 
Um, and I think we're finally seeing China just sort of, you know, begin to make some meager moves in response. Um, so I, I feel like we're already in a new Cold War. Um, and uh, this sort of disagreement, I, I think, is, is uh, uh, just, just um, a sign that China's finally beginning to commit to that. Um, so, yeah, I think I've explained some of that. Um, James Parker, could you explain why you think fighter jets are useless? I was under the impression that SAMs haven't kept up tech-wise since the 1980s. We keep hearing this. Um, oh, SAMs haven't kept up tech-wise in the 1980s. I, on Twitter, I talked about, uh, not on fighter jets, but on tanks. Uh, there was this really fabulously detailed um, article uh, from uh, a, an expert, a formerly U.S. military, uh, I think he probably was a tank commander, um, expert, uh, fellow at the Rand Corporation, um, really just great detailed discussion of tanks. Um, of course, he had an argument he had to make, um, you know, probably professionally obligated to make, which is the tanks were still useful. And what was really fascinating is his main example of why things were more useful, uh, because the, you know, the, 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 why tanks were still useful was exactly what this argument you're putting forward about jets is saying that, well, you know, SAMs haven't really kept up. Surface to air missiles haven't really kept up uh, sort of, but, but according, according to who, according to what test. And in this war on the rocks uh, article with tanks, the main example he had was the Israeli army and how in 1967 tanks really proved their worth, but already even in 1973 in the Yom Kippur war, um, the, uh, the militaries operating against Israel actually had a countermeasure just six years later. So tanks haven't actually been that useful to Israel since the 1970s. The countermeasure, of course, being anti-tank missiles. Um, and then he says, well, you know, turned out in 1973, tanks weren't that useful um, and, you know, almost failed entirely to, to, to defend Israel. But you see, goes the War on the Rocks article, um, there's all these new procedures and these new ways of, of protecting these tanks. And uh, actually now they've got their own missile guided system that takes out the missiles that go against them, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, that's, that's insanely ruinously expensive to have a tank that now has to be a heavily armored tank to be of any use at all, which of course makes it heavier, uses more resources, et cetera, et cetera. It probably means it can operate on fewer kinds of ground. Um, and it's got its own anti-missile system. So you've got like this probably, you know, millions of dollars worth of systems defending millions of dollars worth of junk. It's just, it's really quite extraordinary. And what was really crazy about this War on the Rocks article, he said, like you said, oh, well, you know, the tech hasn't kept up. Tan you know, the tanks are really, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely have tech that can defeat anything that could be sent against them. And the example he used was... Um, Israeli tanks being less and less useful against weaker and weaker opponents. Uh, you know, they almost failed in the Arab-Israeli war against uh, real state militaries um, that were arguably comparable in the 70s. And then in 2006, the tanks failed um, in uh, Lebanon against Hezbollah, uh, a, a, a very heavily armed and sophisticated militia, but a militia nonetheless, and then he was like, but now because of the procedures, the new procedures and the new technology that the Israelis have put on top of tanks, they haven't humiliated themselves in Gaza, you know, like they've, they've managed to, to really compete against Hamas. The Israeli military doesn't bring tanks into Gaza and it's Hamas, like it's a militia that has missiles, but they're missiles that are like you know, put together with spit and bubble gum after they've been uh, smuggled through tunnels. Like it's, it's, uh, it, it, I feel like there's a lot of really, um, is it motivated reasoning or uh, what's the, what are all the confirmation bias or something like that? A lot of arguments being put forward by the US military that all of these systems are still worthwhile and top of the line and can keep people safe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, despite the fact that they literally haven't been tested to, for 80 years. Um, the war against uh, the Iraqi military was not a real test. We haven't fought anybody um, where uh, that could that could conceivably make any dent 
against our higher level systems. They had we haven't fought anybody with any real counter to any of our high level systems. We have no idea whether any of this stuff is worthwhile. And that's why I think it's really, really important for Washington, D.C. to just talk about this mind-blowing incompetence, mind-blowing incompetence of the Russian military. They don't know how to do the most basic combined arms warfare. It's like, yeah, well, guess what? The U.S. military hasn't actually done the most basic combined arms warfare against a real opponent in 80 years. I'm sure we're better able, you know, I'm sure we wouldn't fall into such terrible logistics traps. I mean, I'm not so sure. I think it's, it's likely we wouldn't fall into so many horrific logistics chat traps. Um, but again, we haven't fought a real war. I mean, you know, the Persian Gulf in 2003, before we um, invaded Iraq, we spent three months shipping stuff in to the borders of Iraq. You know, that's not the way a conflict is going to go with China, you know? Like, it, it's not... Um, I don't, I, I just don't buy any of the arguments. Um, and I read the arguments and I look into the arguments and they don't hold up. Um, like this War on the Rocks tanks article that's like, oh no, tanks are fine. They failed against real militaries, then they failed against militias. And they, you know, but they haven't failed against uh, a, an open air prison. You know, they're almost as good as barbed wire. Like if you actually dive into any of these arguments, they're not credible in the slightest. Um, so, yeah. That's what I have to say about that, James Barker. Um, was there another super chat? Did I miss a super chat? Nope. Okay, let's see. Questions. Fadal, uh, the Libyan economy grew by 177% last year. Oil played a big part, but the largest contributor was the service sector, construction and manufacturing. But isn't construction and manufacturing, isn't a lot of that um, in service of the oil sector? Um, yeah, I mean, Libya needs a government. Um, and it seems like the Libya... Libya uh, famously destroyed by the United States in 2011, uh, finally had a deal uh, to rebuild it in 2021. Um, uh, that deal seems to be falling through, but people seem to be reconstructing Libya anyway. Let's let's have hopes that peace is retained. Uh, Multimire, India is a big, ambitious democratic project, hindered in its ambitions through its inner complexity. They should hang more with the EU, could be good friends. Yeah, I mean, debatably. Um, it's interesting. The way I've been thinking about India recently is actually kind of similar to the way that I've been talk, thinking about France, is that for the longest time, um, I'd sort of considered, oh, you know, I mean, this isn't just libertarian, but sort of just basic sort of liberal approach to the issue. It's sort of, uh, oh, you know, India is very similar to France. Like, oh, they just hold on to all this socialist nonsense and insist on producing so much of their stuff at home and and, you know, they should really just jump into the free, the, the free flow of, of uh, globalization, you know, with both feet the way China has. And, you know, it's kind of weird, you know, in the context of everything breaking down the way it has the past couple of years. You know, France and, um, France and India kind of look a lot more clever, <laughs> you know. They, they look, it, it's, it's a lot harder for me to, to sort of uh, lecture these countries from sort of the neoliberal perspective. Um, India famously failed uh, to sort of crush its farm, its agricultural interests over the past three or four years. Um, but the fact that they have such a compelling and not carefully geared towards export globalization mm -hmm. agricultural sector, but one that's still very geared towards serving India's interests, may prove to be very important uh, over the next year or so as the uh, fertilizer wheat and oil and gas shortages uh, start to hit. Um, France, of course, uh, looks a lot better um, with its, no, no, we're going to keep building uh, our nuclear plants because um, that makes us independent. Um, so I don't know. I, I, feel I've, I used to look down on France and India's choices, um, you know, as, as someone who you know, used to read The Economist cover to cover um, and that perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm, less, I'm less critical now. So, um, let's see here. Um, will China throw up tariffs on raw materials from Australia? Um, I mean, they did, didn't they? Um, the, uh, I think famously, the, uh, I think they banned Australian coal for a little while. You know, what that actually means in practice, I mean, coal is a pretty fairly fungible market. Um, you know, 
that just means it gets re-imported through Indonesia or that you know the Australians buy a ton of cheaper um, sorry that Indonesia and Malaysia buy a whole bunch of cheap coal uh, marginally cheaper coal from Australia um, uh, but yeah I think China's already um, I, was it I think Australia publicly called for an investigation into COVID and then China's response was to ban Australian coal. Um, so yeah, that's something that happens. Um, uh, to what extent China is interested? I mean, China is so screwed right now with the COVID lockdowns, you know, supply chains everywhere. So, so messed up. Um, and I think that we're also in what I think folks are calling a commodity super cycle. Um, Australia is, you know, nominally a, um, uh, an industrial uh, modern country or service oriented country, but it's still the reason that China had uh, Australia had that extraordinary uh, what thirty year run without a recession um, was largely because of Chinese resource requirements. Um, but we're in I think we're generally uh, seen as being in a commodity super cycle where all commodity providers are probably uh in a in in better stead now and australia is one of the biggest providers of commodity even australian coal is in demand in the context of disrupted russian oil and gas um so i think to answer your question start so for sure china's already um shown a willingness to target australia specifically um when australia does things that china doesn't want um but whether or not we're going to see anything like that in the next two or three years, I'm, I'm more suspicious. I think we've got a good, solid couple of years of China trying to drag itself out of the current nightmare it's in. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Matthew M. asks, why do French Zoomers support Le Pen? Um, I haven't seen the polling on that. I'm not sure how creditable it is. Um, I think that it's just like a lot of people really dislike um, Emmanuel Macron um, because to some extent he's what I always thought France really needed. I mean, he's the, he's the neoliberal. He's the guy who's bringing Anglo-Saxon economics to France. And I think to some degree France can use a little bit of that. Um, you know, it, it's important to understand just how many social democratic aspirations France has already met, you know, free university, uh, free health care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that Macron has some sort of pro-business instincts, um, deregulatory instincts, isn't a bad thing. Like, I don't think uh, the United States needs any more of that pro-business stuff. We've had quite enough. It's time to try to reconstruct some of our uh, social, uh, you know, some of our more social democratic uh, aspects, um, fix our health care, et cetera, et cetera. France has already solved many of those problems. Um, but what's interesting is that it, it's just unpopular. Um, it's not, uh, um, which is, I guess, a testament to Macron's political skills that he's managed to get reelected in France as a, you know, McKinsey guy, as an investment banker, as a, as a, a sort of Anglo-Saxon economics type guy. Um, so I don't think, you know, do we actually have French Zoomers supporting Le Pen or simply voting against Macron? Um, I think it'd be a more interesting question. Um, because, of course, almost everybody else in the um, French electoral context is all about preserving social democracy, all about pre pre preserving the socialist aspects of the U.S. government, including Le Pen. Uh, sorry, the French government, uh, including Le Pen. Le Pen is not interested in dismantling the welfare state or anything like that. Um, I suppose we should actually probably be grateful that the Republicans are so um, uh, big on the, on that sort of thing. If they weren't, they'd be much more successful in the United States. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got a couple. Uh, Lenko, simply, oh, well, thank you, Lenko. That's very kind. Uh, just a, a very large super chat, simply appreciating your work. That's very kind. Thank you, Lenko. Um <laughs> see here. Um, not to be repetitive, but would you talk about the reaction from India about Ilhan Omar's recent actions? I don't, I'm not aware of this. I would have to Google that. Um, 
Um, I am a big Ilhan Omar fan, however, um, so I would probably support... Um, uh, oh, Ilhan Omar visited Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Oh, interesting. Uh, oh, sorry, well, that's... The, the Indian uh, source calls it uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. So it seems that, like, Ilhan Omar visited Kashmir... Um, and, uh, U.S., this is fascinating. I had no idea. My gosh. Um, so yeah, Ilhan Omar visited Pakistan, um, and presumably, um, because of who she is, I, I'm completely unfamiliar about this, complained about, um, Indian violations of, uh, human rights and, uh, the largest, uh, minority in India to the tune of 160 million people is, of course, Muslims. Um, and yeah, she's, uh, Ilhan Omar is very consistent, uh, and very consistently, um, pro-human rights wherever she goes. That is, I will have to read more. That is kind of a fascinating move, uh, for her to show up in Pakistan, um, and speak in those ways, because that's, of course, not the way that the U.S. government is drifting at this moment. Uh, traditionally, throughout the Cold War, the United States was very, very aligned with Pakistan. Um, long before uh, fighting with the Soviets, uh, because uh, India was a country we did not trust. India had kicked out the British, our you know special relationship pals, and Nehru. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm mispronouncing that. I apologize. Um, you know, Gandhi had his own sort of ideology, um, and Nehru, his successor, um, was very sort of socialism curious. Set up the non-aligned uh, movement was very uninterested in cold warring, uh, whereas the Pakistanis, who are you know, a much smaller country, were desperate for help and were happy to sign on to the Cold War um, you know, if we could help them fight against uh, India. So we'd always been aligned with Pakistan. Oh, obviously, uh, that was uh, tested to some degree when the uh, terrorist groups we set up with Pakistan and Saudi Arabia in the 80s ended up uh, um, attacking the United States in 2001. Um, but, uh, you know, nominally, we're still close allies with uh, Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan presumably flies F-16s. Uh, uh, reconnection successful. Um, I just want to make sure I'm still going here. Uh, I hope I'm still going. It says I'm reconnected. It says I'm still live. If someone could uh, verify in the... Um, if someone could verify in the chat that I am uh, still on here, I would appreciate it. Um, but yeah, so it's really interesting that um, the United States is, of course, much more interested, as we discussed earlier in this presentation, much more interested in working with India now, because India is such a potential counterweight to China. Um, and it's interesting to see Ilhan Omar attempting to work against that. And by going to Pakistan, talking about the plight of the Kashmiris, uh, Kashmir is an interesting um, issue that I haven't dived into the extent that I need to. Um, I think India is vastly more powerful. I think um, certainly the genesis of the Pakistan issue, the Kashmir interest, where it was a largely Muslim uh, territory that just happened to have a Hindu prince in charge of it at the time of independence, um, tends to make me a little more a little warmer towards Pakistan. I'm 100% sure that both Pakistan and India have done horrible, horrible things over Kashmir in the intervening decades. I haven't done a big study of it. What I think um, is less of an open question is uh, the way that Modi, the way the Indian government is treating uh, the large Muslim minority within indisputed, uh, undisputed India, uh, within Assam and other places, you know, stripping folks of citizenship, there was some, uh, some indication they were building camps. It's, um, it's pretty grim. And if Ilhan Omar wants to go to Pakistan and uh, talk about uh, Indian human rights abuses, uh, far be it from me to um, critique her. So, yeah, that's what I have to say about uh, Ilhan Omar in India. Um, we've, got a, oh, we've got a couple of these. Uh, Brandon Commando, Defense Minister of Saudi Arabia, might... <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Uh, Defense Minister of Sage GP might join AUKUS. Thoughts? Defense Minister of... Oh, Japan might join AUKUS. Sorry, Brandon Commander says, Defense Minister of Japan said that Japan might join AUKUS. Thoughts? Um, not a ton. It is very interesting the way that Japan is treated... 
within sort of just the broader um, U.S. alliance structure in the Pacific. Japan is probably our firmest friend. Um, I mean, it has immense economic connections to China, as does Australia, but uh, Japan has been pretty, you know, has gone out on a rather huge limb um, to, uh, oh, has gone out on a rather huge limb to um, disassociate itself with uh, aspects of its uh, constitution and post-war nature that, uh, you know, it's gone through tremendous shifts to, like, do away with pacism, pacifism to a degree, but we just still don't trust them in ways that I think are, frankly, a little racist. You know, we're, we're, we're more eager to, you know, have uh, the, the U.S. president and the British prime minister and the, um, uh, and the Australian prime minister, right, um, just sort of, you know, stand up there together because it's a bunch of white guys who speak English. Um, five Eyes is something that I think about a lot in this context. Uh, five Eyes is what it's New Zealand, Canada, the United States, Australia, and uh, Britain. Uh, intelligence cooperation between all these powers, yet Japan is somehow left out. Um, and it, it's, it's, I mean, maybe racism is, overstates it, but like the, the fact that we still have a tighter cultural affinity with the UK and Australia over... Um, the Japanese who've been incredibly firm allies for um, most of a century now strikes me as pretty fucked up, honestly. Um, so it is interesting. What is AUKUS? What is joining AUKUS? Um, I mean, AUKUS is, I think, uh, sort of a branding at this point um, and mostly a project to sell submarines. Um, does this mean that Japan would be buying some nuclear submarines uh, from the United States? That would certainly be interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah. And the question of whether the United States would um, be interested in helping Japan out in that way. Well, if it involves selling weapons, the United States is almost certainly interested in it. So, yeah, I, I just don't know enough, uh, Brando Commando, about that particular question. Um, <laughs> Staro Pulsaro, thank you for another generous super chat. A lot has been said about British political norms and customs, influences throughout its former colonies, but not much is said about Spain's influence on its former colonies. Do you know what they are? Um, I would say there's some coverage of Spain's. I, I think that, yeah, I think there's a lot of um, literature. Maybe it's just that simply the, the Latin America is not um, as uh, large a topic uh, of geopolitical concern. So it hasn't, uh, hasn't crossed your transom, Star Pulsaro. But uh, the... Um, uh, Spanish influence uh, and its former colonies. I think a, a lot of that just sort of uh, dovetails into uh, geographical aspects. Uh, the fact that uh, most uh, Latin American countries are still oriented towards uh, their coasts and their ports rather than being oriented towards each other. Um, I'd, say, I'd say probably even within uh, some Latin, I mean, Mexico, I think, has, you know, numerous ports, doesn't it? Um, don't quote me on that. I'm sort of getting over my skis a bit. But um, the fact that uh, the Americas are generally not very well connected to themselves are more geared, much like Africa, a lot of their infrastructure is geared towards getting resources out to the imperial, um, you know, the imperial hub in Spain. Um, I think that... Um, there's a lot about Spain, a lot about the way that Spain is organized. Look at Catalan independence now. It was more chunked and more um, uh, has problems with unity or, to put it in a more positive way, is sort of more federalized, more uh, autonomous in its organization. And uh, Latin America has been very autonomous in its, in its organization as well. I think there's very broad, I think there's a lot of literature talking about cultural influences that I'm not too well-versed in, of course, this Catholicism, uh, still tremendously important. I was in Puerto Rico recently, and there was a, I think, yeah, it was a 500-year 500, uh, 500 celebration of uh, the founding of San Juan, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, beautiful little colonial town, one of the nicest I've seen. Um, sort of colonial, Spanish colonial towns, the, the building, much of old San Juan, 
um, is you know three four hundred years old, or at least in its founding. Of course, there's been some rebuilding since. Um, but uh, there was a the city of San Juan had two uh, in their museum of San Juan. They had two exhibits. One was the history of the city over the past five hundred years, and then the other was the history of religion in the city over the past five hundred years. Um, and I think famously, there's been a lot of a very strange new growth of more Protestant Christianity, um, both in uh, Latin American migrants to the U.S. and within Latin American countries. Um, but Catholicism is huge, huge influence, uh, very much still vibrant today um, in Latin America. And that is, that is from those most Christian monarchs, um, you know, Ferdinand and Isabella, the Spanish influence. Um, there's, there's something, I feel like Star Wars, I think there's something, there's a really glaring, uh, Spanish influence on Latin America that I'm just missing entirely, um, and I'm not expressing, but rest assured that there are, there are, is discussion of this. Um, it is something that folks talk about a lot. I mean, just the whole, like, encomienda system, the whole Caudillo approach in Latin America, the, I think Caudillo is another way of saying strong man. Um, you know, there's, it was the way that, um, Spain initially set up its empires was with sort of a semi-feudal approach, uh, with, uh, peasants maintained in real penury and in, in real poverty, uh, was a serious, uh, bar to Latin American development and is in some senses, I think many would agree, continues to be a problem for U.S. development today. Sorry for, for Latin American development today. So, um, I hope that was helpful. Um, <laughs> I'm here. Okay, good. I'm here. Happy to hear it. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, let's, you know what? I've got 10 people on Spotify, on uh, TikTok. What do I want to even say? Most things you got wrong, and I've wasted time believing you. So Stefano Antonelli. Well, that's sad. Um, I think I'm right about many things, but I'm probably wrong about many things, too. Um, okay, so that's enough of that TikTok heard from. Um, Daxton Min, uh, how do you think China's client states and international projects will be affected if the Communist Party falls halfway during the new Cold War? Um, probably not much. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, do, I would expect the Communist Party of China to fall um, this century for sure, uh, possibly within a decade or two. Um, I mean, China doesn't really have... Client states, uh, you can make an argument that they're trying to turn Pakistan into a client state. Um, I think if, you're, if you really want to look for like true imperial plans and plots on, on China's part, it's, it's Pakistan you have to look at. And I don't see that necessarily as a Cold War thing. I see that as a self-defense thing. I see that as a, well, we desperately need the United States com completely controls the waters uh, are 200 miles and more off of China's coast. Uh, China now, I think most would agree, controls the sort of 200 miles off of its coast. Uh, so they desperately need a backdoor, and Pakistan sort of is that backdoor. I think all of the projects in Pakistan would absolutely continue um, if the Communist Party fell. Uh, whatever government that, f that followed um, the Chinese Communist Party would have the same strategic concerns as China and would desperately want uh, a stronger Pakistan, um, not just for, you know, the back door against the United States, but longer term, um, as China looks forward to competing with India, you know, they want a good relationship with Pakistan. <laughs> see, questions, questions, questions. Do we have questions? Thoughts on the situation in Venezuela? Not many. Uh, I'm pissed. Um, I was very excited. Um, I think I made that clear in a number of videos. I was pretty excited about the prospect of uh, Venezuela um, and the United States sort of normalizing relations somewhat. Um, and it hasn't happened, mostly because uh, the Biden administration sent high-level uh, diplomatic uh, figures to um sent high-level diplomatic figures to, um, uh, to Venezuela uh, in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They looked like they were going to make a deal. Uh, Maduro said encouraging things. 
and we've seen nothing uh, for two months now, mostly because of the same uh, bloodthirsty dipshits in Congress. Uh, Marco Rubio, Tom Cotton, Bob Menendez, uh, just awful, awful people like Ted Cruz. Um, uh, just need need war everywhere. Need, you know, just can't can't conceive of giving up the possibility of um, some kind of a military conflict um, at some point. Uh, so unfortunately, it, it might, maybe I've missed it, but I don't think things are working moving forward with um, Venezuela um, in the slightest. Um, <laughs> see, we got questions. Ali Razi says, uh, more freedom finance, what you said about Japan, would you say the same about Europe and European countries as well, U.S. not trusting them? Um, I think not, not as much. Um, I think that the U.S. obviously is closer to the United Kingdom than we are to sort of France or Germany, but I think that there's uh, a real uh, investment, at least in the idea that there's real cultural, infini cultural affinities between uh, the United States and all of Europe, not just um, uh, not just uh, the uh, United Kingdom. Um, so yeah, but for sure, uh, if it's a question between Britain and France and Germany, even when it's not in our economic interest to do so, well, we will tend to go uh, with Britain to some extent, um, and I find that. But no, I do think we treat. Uh, Japan with a sort of lower and less, um, yeah, as in, in, a, in, a, in a different and lower status. Um, I mean, there are real affinities, you know, the, you know, the legacy of the West, whatever that means, Christianity, um, you know, diaspora, but, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of Japanese diaspora in the United States as well. Um, and that's something actually that could shift or is in the process of shifting. I think that, uh, in coming decades, I mean, one of the great utilities of sort of wokeness or um, this idea that we need to be very concerned about, you know, the influence of dead white men, et cetera, et cetera, in the United States is, um, yeah, I can understand a lot of people find that very irritating, but it's also tremendously useful from an imperial context um, the ex to the extent that um, the people in the United States become less uh, Western-centric actually allows the United States to work better and more closely with people all over the world. Um, that's one of the great strengths of the United States that Europe lacks, China lacks, India lacks, is that we have the ability to hold on to our central principles, but also morph culturally in ways um, that allow us to work better with everybody. Um, that's, the, that's the hope anyway. Um, we'll see if it works out that way in practice. You know, it should take a couple hundred years to figure out whether it works. Low cool extreme. Uh, what do you think of the idea the U.S. let China have the Solomon Islands so they could justify their new Cold War gobbledygook? I think that's a little too paranoid. I think that's just um, the, as I point out, most people in the U.S. military industrial complex believe, like, believe they're doing right. There's very, there's, there, there, there's, you know, there's no sinister, you know, maybe Dick Cheney, you know, there's, there's no, there's very little uh, sinister uh, manipulation here. They really do believe they're doing right. And for the U.S. to just sort of be like, huh, well, if we don't, if we, you know, uh, idiotically uh, refuse to rebuild our embassy and uh, don't give the Solomon Islands really basic, easy pennies aid, then maybe they'd go over to China. I, that just that requires a, a degree of calculation and a willingness to actually give up something that's strategically worthwhile. Um, the potential of China being in the Solomon Islands and the growing potential of China being in the Solomon Islands is a real loss for the United States and Australia in the context of you know um, the coming decades or even probably not centuries. But, you know, the coming decade, maybe even, you know, centuries. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I think the idea that, you know, the U.S. let this happen just so we can sell more weapons seems, I think that's, that, that I would, I, I'm a pretty paranoid guy, I'll go, go extreme, but I think that goes a little far. A little far. Lenko, the answer to both Canadian questions and the Solomon Islands question for me is, what does the monarch have to say about it? <laughs> 
I mean, that's true. Solomon Islands, Canada, technically, uh, Queen Elizabeth II is the, uh, the head of state for both, technically, right? But I think Trudeau and uh, Sogavare uh, have a little more influence on how those things go. Um, let's see. Um, it's interesting on TikTok. You know, I, I don't pay enough attention um, to TikTok Live when uh, I'm here, so there aren't that many folks there. But yeah, I should just go answer another TikTok question. Um, we got a question here. Uh, we no, we don't. We've got a we got a laughing my ass off. Um, yeah, you are on. I'm still online. That's good. I love your hair, by the way. Well, thanks. That's very kind. Uh, Europe is going through a conservative cycle as the U.S. goes through a liberal one. I don't think this is a particularly liberal or leftist cycle we're going through. I'd, I'd see sort of backlash and uh, rather than actual uh, change. Um, what do you think about the U.K. Rwanda relocation program for asylum seekers? It is an, I haven't, you know, people have mentioned that to me a couple times. This idea that uh, the UK is going to relocate asylum seekers to Rwanda, I haven't actually looked into the details. I don't know what that actually entails. Um, I'm not sure if it's as batshit racist as, um, as it seems. However, I do have a general sense that uh, UK asylum procedures are appalling. Um, and I say this as an American... Uh, where we have recently set up a uh, appalling and inadequate um, asylum and immigration system. We, we've sort of consciously sabotaged um, our system over the past 30 years, and I think the British, but I think the British have arguably done worse. Um, the, the, you know, we do let some people through the U.S. system eventually, if they're incredibly savvy um, and incredibly patient. Um, it seems like the United Kingdom is just no longer interested in taking asylum seekers at all. Um, to the point where, you know, they've one of the greatest uh, sort of soft power victories the British have had this century is um, being seen as a sort of leader of the elements supporting Ukraine. Uh, I've sort of been kind of blown away by just how affectionate and uh, excited, uh, you know, Zelensky seemed to be to have Boris Johnson around. I'd say unquestionably Ukraine has saved Boris Johnson's career. Um, but even in the context of all that positivity, both for Boris Johnson personally and for the British, you know, sense of itself, because the British, all of them are fully up their ass about their own asses, about still being a great power and still mattering. And Ukraine is, you know, stroking that, that, that for them um, uh, infinitely. And even in that context, even in the context, the racist context of like a bunch of white people, many of whom are highly educated, uh, the British can't get it together to actually um, let Ukrainians in. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, my, I don't know the details of this uh, deal that the UK government has done with, um, uh, has done with, uh, the Rwandans, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if it were quite sinister and quite stupid. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, have we gotten more super chats? Um, I mean, I don't want to be greedy, but I mean, folks have been very generous. Um, do we have questions here or? <laughs> Still. <laughs> Still thinks the U.S. is special for its diversity, while it has a slightly higher migrant percentage than the average EU country. I would say we have a significantly higher migrant percentage than the average EU country. I think we're currently at 1 in 10. Uh, 1 in 10 uh, people in the United States were not born here. Uh, I'd be Maybe I'm completely incorrect about my... Um, uh, my my uh, understanding of Europe, but I'm pretty sure nobody, um, maybe the Swedes are getting are getting towards uh, one in ten, um, uh, ten, fully ten percent of the population being from uh, uh, not uh, being born elsewhere. I, I really don't think that's the case, Malta. Um, but uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, why is the UK so pro-Ukraine? Uh, I think uh, the UK is very pro-Ukraine for exactly what I was just talking about. The, the, the British are very concerned uh, 
and very much like the idea that they are still an international power that matters. And they do have uh, a defense industry that has uh, end laws, um, you know, has, has things to sell um, or things to donate, which then, of course, the UK government, you know, purchases. Um, these are uh, really prime concerns uh, for the British. So they love the Ukraine situation because it gives them an opportunity uh, in the context of complete defense by the United States and complete identity of interests with the United States, it gives them the opportunity to look like great powers again. It gives them an opportunity to stand on the big, you know, stand on a smaller stage with just the United States um, and look, look, look smart and powerful again. So that's the main thing. Ireland, is it one in six not born here? Oh, well, yeah, but that's if you include Europeans, which seems... Yeah, seems uh, um, seems different. Uh, seems different to me. Um, will there be nuclear war? Um, yes, definitely. There will definitely be nuclear war. The key question is when. Um, I've talked about this. This is what I've talked about on this channel for it's eight years now. Um, Unquestionably, there will be a World War III, there will be nuclear war, there will be incredible, horrific, costly nuclear conflict. It's a question of time. Um, and we can set up a world system uh, that delays that horrific date for hundreds of years. Um, but we're not going to get to a point where, you know, uh, you know it will, um, if, the, if the human race uh, continues to exist for another thousand years, then there will be nuclear war at some point during it. But maybe it'll be nuclear war on Mars. Who knows? Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's entirely up to us how well we organize the world to avoid war. Um, I would argue that many U.S. choices over the past 30 years have not been specifically the way that it's treated China and Russia, have been acting in ways as to make war more likely, make nuclear war more likely. Um, certainly the way we treat Iran, the way we treated North Korea, um, you know, there's been tremendous fuck-ups. Um, but yeah, nuclear war is definitely inevitable. Um, but it doesn't have to be in any of our lifetimes. It doesn't have to be in any of our grandchildren's lifetimes. Uh, we just need to organize things better. Uh, most countries, let's see. So yeah, I think if you include, um, as I'm sure uh, many European governments do, the fact that they have freedom of movement for other Europeans, then yes, I suppose you could probably get to um, uh, high levels of migrants in these countries. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really find that particularly persuasive, whereas the United States has folks from uh, everywhere. Um, not just the EU. <laughs> uh, do you think that immigration reform is a real possibility in the U.S. anytime soon? No. Uh, I mean, I want it to be. Um, I want it to be. Um, I think we need it. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to me that we've got... Um, uh, everybody cares about the labor shortage. Everybody cares about inflation, both of which have been driven by... Um, driven in part by uh, falling immigration levels, um, but that's not, um, that's not, I'm not seeing that anywhere in our public discourse, um, which is irritating, so. Why does leftism have such a weak grip on the U.S. and Japanese political spheres compared to Europe? Um, I think we're seeing leftism having a pretty declining grip on Europe as well. But if we're talking about sort of historic social de democracy, I mean, my understanding is that Japanese uh, education is free, healthcare is free. Is, is that incorrect? Um, I think it's most industrialized countries um, have a much more generous um, social uh, contract than the United States does. Um, and there are n numerous reasons for, for that. Um, the United States is traditionally organized in a much more federal nature. You know, we fought a, a civil war establishing the baseline uh, that states didn't have the right to secede anymore. But um, we're still all over the country, not just in, you know, right-oriented places, still very committed to uh, 
each state going its own way. Um, and uh, we lack our freedom. Um, that's uh, certainly something that's abused, but uh, um, is like very central to our constitution, central to, um, and also just the fact that um, historically, uh, Americans have just been so much richer than everybody else. Um, a really interesting fact, fact is just in the 1700s, 1800s, the standard of living in the United States was just so vastly superior to everywhere else. That, you know, and it's something that happens today. I talk a lot about the sort of 1% versus 20% thing. You know, if you really do have a 99% versus the 1% situation, then yeah, you're going to have a revolution. But what we have in the United States still today is sort of a 20% versus 80% situation. 80%, I believe, 80% of Americans have been quite poorly served by the past um, sort of Reagan era dispensation, um, you know, pro business, everything, everything. Um, but 20% of Americans, like, you know, I'd say one in five Americans, a really significant chunk, have done amazingly well. Um, so, um, and it's a lot harder to bring about revolutionary change or, you know, mildly socialist change in a system where 20% of the country is doing extraordinarily well. Whereas when, um, I mean, obviously the wars had a lot to do with it, but in Europe, um, when these choices were being made in the 50s, 60s, um, it was a much smaller elite of beneficiaries that was being dispossessed. And that's, I think, been the case throughout um, the course of American history. There's just been a larger class of, there's always been a larger class of winners in the United States. And no, not saying that, you know, uh, Joe Schmo with a 401k is winning to anywhere near the same extent as like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, but Joe Smo with the 401k with a retirement account is winning enough to not be interested in um, serious changes. And, you know, whereas in the 1700s or the 1800s, it was, you know, Joe Schmo had his own farm, um, meager as it was, now it's the top 20% of Joe Schmo's have, um, you know, significant retirement accounts with, enough, uh, you know, enough Amazon and Google stock in there that, uh, you know, they, they feel like winners out of the system. Um, and I think the fact that the United States has always had a broader base of folks who considered themselves winners from the U.S. system meant it was less likely that the system would change. Oh, cool. Uh, what if Altist mentioned my critique video of him on his Reddit? I hadn't noticed that. If somebody's got a link to that... Please uh, uh, drop it. Uh, please send it to me on Twitter or something. I'd love to see that. What if all this was talking about my critique? Oh, that's nice. Um, Maltemeyer, there's a reason why there is a much higher percentage of Muslims in the EU than in the U.S. Um, I don't know. Much higher percentage of Muslims in the EU than in the U.S. and that are not all Bosniaks. Um, yeah, sure, Algerians. Um, uh, Algerians, Moroccans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's mostly France, right? I mean, France has got something like what seven percent? It's five percent, five to seven percent. Um, in France, are Muslim, uh, but at this point, I mean, a very high percentage of Muslims would have been born in France, right? Um, <laughs> Victory TRD asks, why is there so much stupidity in U.S. politics? That's a great question. Uh, there's a lot of stupidity in a lot of people's politics. A um, lot of stupid stuff. Um, yeah, Daxton Min, I think you'd have to send the link on um, Twitter. I don't know if you can, as a non-moderator, I don't know if you're allowed to post um, the link. Um, Brandon Commando, there has never been a leftist revolution in a country with a middle class. That's not true, uh, which is why the U.S. is nowhere near having a revolution. Sorry, Brandon Commando, yeah, that's not, I don't think that's really accurate. Having a revolution, I mean, the middle class will side with the right wing and the right wing rule. Um, there's a great podcast, uh, Mike Duncan's Revolutions, and I think he talks a lot about that. I mean, I think the brand of, I think the, maybe the key variable you're talking about actually there is the size of the middle class. I mean, pre-revolutionary Russia had a growing middle class. Um, there were definitely, uh, as you're sort of getting back in the pre-industrial terms, but before the French Revolution, you definitely had um, elements that could be described as a middle class. 
But I think Brando Commandos, as I was saying, what we're talking about is the size of that middle class. Um, whereas in the U.S., there has always been a middle class or middle class-ish thing that is sizable enough to not be for um, uh, um, to not be for uh, um, revolution or socialism or what have you. Uh, who is Joe Schmo? Yeah, that's uh, John Doe. Uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, Joe Schmo is just a you know way of saying John Q. Public or something random. Um, <laughs> uh, will China's lockdowns screw over Saudi Arabia's chances of surviving this decade? Well, I would argue that, um, you know, Saudi Arabia, I have argued that Saudi Arabia has no chance of surviving this decade. As, as Saudi Arabia, it'll be as Arabia, and it'll still be pumping oil, but it won't have a Saudi royal family. Um, uh, so I think they were all, always screwed, but no question that China's lockdowns have been terrible for Russia, terrible for Saudi Arabia, terrible for Texas, terrible for Oklahoma, um, terrible for oil producers everywhere. This should have been, and was looking to be in the initial weeks of Russia's invasion, um, you know, the, the return um, to incredible oil and gas scarcity um, that uh, oil producers had been missing uh, for quite some time, um, for, for almost a decade. Um, and China's lockdowns have screwed that right up. Um, that is not, that is no longer uh, something that's the case. Um, Germany has been aiding Iraq rebuild its industry that was destroyed in the 1990s and the 2000s. Germany has been doing good in MENA recently. That's phenomenal. Um, I mean, Germany, I don't know enough about German uh, foreign aid um, to talk about, you know, relative levels, but my understanding is that they generally have been fairly hel uh, helpful. It's interesting in, in, um, it's interesting sort of considering, you know, Germany in Iraq, because I still, and perhaps unfairly, uh, Fadal, you can correct me on this, but I, I still, maybe it's just the U.S. soldiers are, <laughs> are in danger and nobody else in Iraq, but I still associate Iraq with being a, 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 a dicey place to be for security purposes. Um, I don't know, maybe that's no longer accurate. Um, and with Germany, n historically, not being willing to put soldiers in harm's way would make it seem more difficult for them to be involved in projects. Um, but yeah, perhaps that's no longer accurate. Perhaps uh, the um, Iraqi military forces that were built up to uh, crush Mosul um, have more credibility and are able to provide uh, the security necessary for German contractors, donors. I'm very happy to hear uh, that that's the case. Um, what is the electricity situation like in Iraq? Is something I'd like to know. Because, I mean, just for the most basic illegitimacy of the U.S. occupation was that it was even worse than Saddam Hussein under massive sanctions at providing basic... Um, at, at, at providing basic... Um, at providing basic energy provision, which was a real problem. Um, so yeah, that, that's fascinating, Fadal. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the super chat. Um, but yeah, I just don't know. Um, I should look into that a little more. Don't know enough about Germany and Iran. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, it has been uh, about almost two hours. Uh, my name is Robert Morris. Uh, I do something here every Tuesday. Gosh, now I do something here every day on uh, uh, Mo Freedom Foundation. Recently, I've. Uh, not just been doing daily shorts, but I also do daily posts. Uh, some of them uh, on the community page, some of them ending up being quite lengthy. Um, I'm not sure how sustainable it is for me to be posting two things on YouTube every day, but I'm pretty desperate. Um, and sort of post Ukraine, I got a nice little bump for Ukraine and it seems to be diminishing. Um, but yeah, I've got uh, uh, daily uh, shorts and uh, text posts. Uh, usually with a link to a video from my past eight years of production. Um, on YouTube, um, I'm on TikTok. Uh, not On YouTube, it's Mo Freedom Foundation. On TikTok, it is More Freedom Foundation with the R-E. Uh, not enough characters in, um, on YouTube. I have an uh, Instagram account, More Freedom Foundation. 
and I can be found on Twitter at Robo Law. Um, please do look me up in all these places. Uh, this channel is uh, would not be would not have lasted as long as it has if it weren't for the generosity of patrons. Uh, some folks uh, donate on PayPal, um, and some donate through Patreon. Uh, folks who sign up on Patreon get access to two patrons only uh, pieces of media every month. Um, there, well, not really. I guess technically media. Um, there's the patrons only newscast. I can't cover everything that people want me to cover on this channel, but once a month I give it a try for the patrons only newscast. I have a list of topics of things that have happened over the past month, as well as anything that patrons ask me to look into. Um, and I, uh, sort of spend about 20 minutes looking into each of them and provide a, uh, quick rundown of important stuff from the past month. That's for patrons only. I believe the next one will be coming up uh, Saturday, May 7th. I think that's right. Uh, you can join me there. In addition, we also have a Discord server. Discord server that is available to all patrons um, and only, only the patrons. Uh, we've got ongoing discussions uh, on topics from all over the world uh, with people from all over the world. We've got probably about well, 20, probably about 20 folks who regularly contribute. Uh, 20 patrons who are regularly uh, chatting on uh, the Discord server. And then once a month, we do sort of a sort of a Zoom call. I don't prepare anything. We all just sort of hang out and, uh, you know, shoot the breeze uh, about what's going on uh, in the world. And it's a lot of fun. Um, at Loga has very helpfully provided a link to the Patreon uh, in the chat if you want to check that out. I've also written a number of books uh, that can be found uh, from Amazon links on um on my YouTube homepage, um, most recently I wrote Avoiding the British Empire, which is sort of a stealth history of the world since uh, 1750. Uh, recommended highly, explains a ton of stuff uh, about five years ago now, geez. Um, I wrote a book called Everybody's Lying About Islam, which uh, detailed uh, the U.S.-Saudi relationship and the way that it had created almost all of the terrorism that we'd been so focused upon uh, for the past 20 years in the United States. Um, and yeah, it would be great, um, to see, um, more folks sign up on Patreon, um, and buy books and whatnot. Um, and I think with that, um, uh, we're going to close because I'm beginning to lose coherence. Thank you guys so much for being there. Um, did I respond to my question? Matthew, Sonny, three, three, three. I didn't quite see the question. Um, did I, is there a super chat that I missed? I don't think so. Um, anyway, um, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for being here and, uh, thank you for, um, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, all the best. End stream. End stream. Okay.